Hello. Um, hopefully you all can hear me. <laughs> Welcome to an adventure. Today on Archival Adventures, we are exploring the Black History at Virginia Tech timelines on episode number seven of Archival Adventures. Uh, before we begin, I have a couple of acknowledgments that I need to go through here. Need to, more want to. Um, we acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. We acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university in accordance with the university's efforts to transform an historic location into a site for the interpretation of the African-American experience on campus and in the region. So as I said, today we're going to be looking at uh, the Black History at Virginia Tech timelines. So some of what I have just talked about in the acknowledgments will probably come up in the timelines as we're going through them. Also, you may have noticed that there is a, um, I think it's over here, uh, a little graphic in the corner there. Um, today started at noon, I believe, is Virginia Tech Giving Day. Um, so if you're on the VTUL Studios channel, uh, you should have, uh, Mubot will drop in some information about Giving Day. Um, essentially, it is a fundraising campaign for uh, various portions of the university, one of which is the university libraries. So if you do want to support the university libraries financially, it helps to support things like the Twitch stream, um, as well as other things that we do in our studios, including 3D printing, um, uh, VR environment creation. Um, we're building a prototyping studio. So things like that, uh, where we get some innovative tools and make them available to the public, not just to students here at Virginia Tech. Um, so there will be information there on the VTUL Studios channel. But otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Also, if you've got questions as we go along, feel free to drop them in chat. Um, and I will address those questions as I see them. Um, also, those questions can be about the materials we're looking at, or you're welcome to ask about um, archives in general, um, archival practice, things like that. Today, uh, somewhat different from all of the previous shows that we have done, uh, we are looking exclusively at digital materials. So um, many of the things we're going to look at today, we have physical copies of, but we are going to be looking specifically at our online timeline. Um, so it has scanned copies of materials, it has some interviews in it and things like that. Um, I'm uncertain how those will go, whether I'll be able to play them and have you hear them. Um, or not, we'll, we'll try it out and maybe they'll work and maybe they won't and we'll just look at the transcripts. We'll see. Uh, all of the, the Twitch stuff is relatively new and so we're, um, we're giving it a shot. Uh, and, and we'll see what works and improve for the future. So let me get us over to the timelines here. Um, do, 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 do. Just have to switch which scene I am on. All right, you should be able to see. <laughs> you should be able to see what I am seeing on my second computer here. Um, and that is Special Collections and University Archives Online. Uh, this is the home for all of our um, scanned and born digital materials uh, that we make available to the public through Virginia Tech Special Collections and University Archives. Um, it is a site built on Omeka, uh, O-M-E-K-A, and um, 
This is an older version of Omeka. There is a newer version of Omeka available. It also has a lot of custom CSS, some of which is broken, which you will get to see, because uh, navigating to the timelines will take me through there. But um, it is kind of the best that we've got right now, and it works. It provides the access. So I'm going to click on over to Exhibits. Um, one thing that Omeka does really well with digital content is create exhibits. So um, the, the one thing <laughs> that is very obviously broken here is the way the exhibits display on our site. Um, you can see it's a little bit not pretty, um, and that's because the custom CSS is not functioning properly. But here we have Black History at Virginia Tech. And uh, it's labeled, this exhibit explores significant events surrounding the history of the black community at Virginia Tech and the surrounding areas from the 1770s to today. So if I bring that up, there's a little bit of information here at the beginning about the people who worked on these timelines and um, how they sort of came about. So that is the first thing that I'm going to start with. Um, the timeline of black history at Virginia Tech was first created by the University Archives in 2002, and it was created to celebrate 50 years of black students at Virginia Tech. Um, the university archivist at the time, Tamara Canelli, directed the project with help from students Justin Yovaniti, uh, Mohamed Amin, and Oladuni Akinpelu, um, and many other people contributed ideas and materials to build the online exhibit. And so that exhibit was housed originally on our old website, and it was a lot of HTML pages that you would click through. Hi, Hannah. Welcome to the show. Um, if you have questions as we go along, please do let me know. Uh, we're exploring the Black History at Virginia Tech timelines today. Um, in the fall of 2017, uh, graduate student Jamel Simmons uh, began work to update the timelines to add in content from 2000 and on. Um, and then in spring of 2018, the timelines were migrated from the old website into the current format on our Omeka site, um, which gives a much more uh, modern feel to the timelines. But um, uh, so the, the new version is built using Timeline JS. I will note there have been some issues since November with um, some of the Google, Google Sheets tools, um, specifically with Google Sheets permissions, that help to feed Timeline JS, which has caused some problems and taken the timelines offline a couple of times. Um, these were things that we had no control over and were not announced, and so they're bugs that came up. Um, I checked a couple hours ago and they were working. So hopefully they work. If not, I have a backup plan. Um, <laughs> but Timeline JS is an open source application developed by the Knight Lab at Northwestern University. I do want to go through, just because these credits are very important, these people spent a lot of time and were very dedicated to making these th happen. Um, special thanks to Latanya Walker, the Alumni Association's Director of Alumni Relations for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. Uh, Cheryl Montgomery, the former Black Graduate Student Organization President. Danielle Lusk for TEDx Virginia Tech. Uh, Joseph Fraser, coordinator of the Cultural and Community Centers um, back when this was put together. Uh, Kimberly Williams, who was, at the time this was built, Assistant Director for the Black Cultural Center. She later became Director for the Black Cultural Center and has moved on to further her education. Uh, Dave Knackle, uh, who was Senior Director of Photography and Design for Virginia Tech Athletics, and graduate student, uh, the Graduate Student Association Officers Alexandra Heiler, Edoa Ba Duomo, and Joshua Slauenhaupt. And I apologize if I have mispronounced any of those names. Those were the first times that I have read most of them. So uh, hopefully I did okay. Um, and just a note at the end there, um, this exhibit is still a work in progress, and we are still adding new content. Um, so we are going to dive in. Um, you'll see here the exhibit is actually broken up into decades. Um, 
there's pre-1950, and you'll note the description that we looked at before said that this starts in like the 1770s. Um, I think that's what it said, but uh, most of it, the bulk of the timeline is going to be 1950 and on. And so we've got 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and 2010s. We don't yet have one for the 2020s. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Um, we will start with pre-1950s here and uh, see what comes up. Um, you may have seen this image if you came in from our Twitter account. Um, I used this image uh, on the like flyer or tweet for today's episode. Um, and this is the cover image for the 1950s, or pre-1950s timeline. Um, this is Uncle Sporty, uh, and that is the title given to this person in the 1906 Bugle. Um, the Bugle, if you're unfamiliar, is Virginia Tech's uh, yearbook. So this is actually a scan from the yearbook. Um, and this is Uncle Sporty. And I don't know very much personally about Uncle Sporty. Um, I don't know if this is going to give me any information either. Uh, so I clicked through in the link under the picture, and this is actually Uncle Sporty, um, the full image. And you see here, this is actually the image from the yearbook, and at the bottom you can see in quotation marks below the image it says Uncle Sporty. I'm not sure how well that comes across on stream. Hopefully it is legible. Um, and there's not a whole lot of other information given here about Uncle Sporty. I'm not versed in his story, so I don't know much more than what is being given here. Um, maybe there will be something that will be told at some point, or maybe one of the mods might know more. Um, Kira, if you happen to know, I would love to learn about Uncle Sporty. Um, I could also try doing some Googling and seeing if I can figure it out, but I think there are other things I can focus on. So it's barely legible in the yearbook, Hannah, so that's possibly part of why it's hard to make out on screen. Um, so the next item in the timeline here, so you'll note that Uncle Sporty here didn't actually give, oh, January 1st, 1772? No, that's not right. I, th I think this is just the cover image for the timeline. I don't think it, that's the actual date. Um, So here in July of 1772, we have Smithfield House. And if you were here for the um, land acknowledgments that I read at the beginning, um, Smithfield was a plantation that was on the land that Virginia Tech sits on. Um, and so Smithfield House, the construction of the plantation house was begun in July of 1772. Uh, the picture here is Smithfield Plantation as it appeared in 1958. Um, I can try and let's see, view full size image. So here is the actual Smithfield Plantation house uh, from 1958. Um, and this would have been the house that construction began on in 1772. Also, since I don't have any physical materials out today, I have water without having to move to the side, <laughs> which is a luxury for this uh, archives stream. I'm gonna close these extra tabs and move forward. So we're just in the early history now. We don't have a lot of information on the timeline here. There's not a lot of context, but these are some of the early items. Um, here we have July of 1774, so two years after they began construction on the house, the, Prestons, the Preston family move into Smithfield. So this is Colonel William Preston and his pregnant wife, Susanna Smith. Um, their seven children and Jane Buchanan, who was in their care, 
moved into the still unfinished house. So two years on, the house is not finished. Um, the house was named in honor of Susanna. So it's Smithfield after Susanna's um, family, the Smith family. Um, the image that we have accompanying this data, or this point, is um, the Smithfield Preston Burying Ground. Um, this photo is from Reverend Ellison Smythe, or Smith, um, and it notes, when Susanna Preston died in June 1823, she was buried on top of William Preston in the same grave with him. Um, so that I'm uncertain why that would have been done at that time, um, but I know it's something that used to happen and something that potentially could still happen. Um, but yeah, so we have a, a photo of the actual little graveyard that's on the that was on the Smithfield plantation. Um, I'm not going to focus a ton of time on the Smithfield plantation stuff because <laughs> when a lot of this stuff like. The Prestons that we're talking about, they're part of black history at Tech, but they also are white people. Um, and I'd rather move past this and get to actually talking about some of the actual um, black figures here at Virginia Tech. But I did want to start with this early, early history of the area and what became Virginia Tech. So 1774 to 1872, much of what is now the campus of Virginia Tech was part of the plantation belonging to the Preston family. Shortly before the American Revolution, William Preston established Smithfield just west of what later became Blacksburg. Over the next hundred years, Preston and his descendants lived at Smithfield and, like many Virginia planters, employed dozens of enslaved African Americans on their land. I'm not sure that I would have chosen the word employed, um, but yes, there were dozens of enslaved African Americans that worked the land at Smithfield Plantation um, <clears throat> and in their home to perform a variety of farm and domestic chores. By the 1850s, part of Smithfield had become a separate farm known as Solitude that belonged to Robert T. Preston, a grandson of William, and in 1872, Solitude was sold to the state and became part of the land on which the Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College was established. And Solitude still stands today. Um, Solitude is the oldest building on campus um, and was originally part of Smithfield Plantation. Um, so this is, let's see, June 28th, 1782, and the headline reads, Preston dies, the 51 enslaved on the plantation, which I'm uncertain what that title means, so I'm going to read through this, and uh, you're all going to join me because you're here, and that's what I'm doing on the stream. Um, William Preston died. He bequeathed the use and profits of his plantations, enslaved persons, and stock to Susanna if, quote, she continues single and superintended and, and superintend the raising and education of her children, particularly her daughters, and that she will within five years after my decease determine on which tract she intends to reside and spend the remained of her days. Uh, she chose to reside at Smithfield. So she inherited from her husband on the condition that she remained single. Um, the plantation prospered until the management of Susanna and her eldest son, John, or under. They sold ginseng, corn, hemp, and whiskey. There were 51 enslaved persons, Rachel, Tom, Ambrose, Aggie, Will, Nancy, Abraham, Clara, Joe, John, Samuel Jones, Fanny, Lucy, Amy, Bob, Oscar, Davy, George, Reuben, and Jim. Um, and they ended up with Preston's children. Rachel, Moses, Flora, Esther, Granville, Lucius, Alfred, Ned, Jenny, Peggy, Sally, Rosie, Charles, Kathy, and Old Primus um, were not retained by the family. 
and Kira uh, notes in the chat here, the Prestons were big on educating their daughters, which was progressive for the time. But of course, Susanna's name is rarely on the paperwork. Usually it is one of her sons on behalf of her. Um, and then we also had Sam, Cynthia, Nancy, Jack, Young Primus, Stephen, Peter, Chloe, Becky, Lewis, Silly, Sucky, Jax John, Flora, and Othella, who stayed at Smithfield. And um, that was a lot of names, but I also think it is very important to actually name enslaved persons that are come across in history. Um, so much of the description of that time period and of records about enslaved persons <clears throat> just talks about them as slaves and doesn't, even if they're named in the documents from the time, it doesn't use their name. And that doesn't give what little respect that we can to them. So I, I love that their names are actually included in here and I think that is very important in talking about the history of slavery in the United States is to recognize that these were people um, and ha giving them their names and, and listing out the 51 names of um, the people who were enslaved by the Preston family at the time of Preston's death, uh, I think is very important. So that's why I took the time to do that. So here we have a book cover for a book more than one, uh, more than a fraction, along with a photo of Carrie Mosley Hobbs, who was the author. Um, and this is specifically about 1872 to the 1880s. During the 1870s, a number of African Americans helped build the campus of uh, Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College. None were known by name. By 1880, at least five African Americans were working regularly on the campus of Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College and can be identified from the federal census taken that year. Andrew Oliver lived with his family in Blacksburg and worked as a janitor. Four other African Americans, Martha Jackson, George Jackson, Lewis Smith, and Dennis Ballard, were identified on the census as servants living in a dormitory on campus and working to take care of the 70 students living in the dorm. And so that is information coming from this book by Carrie Mosley Hobbs, More Than a Fraction. Uh, here we get the history of Uncle Sporty. Um, I'm glad that it's in here because I didn't know it and it troubled me that all I had was the name. Uh, Charles Owens is um, the actual name of Uncle Sporty. So this is from 1890. Charles Owens started working for Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College in 1890 as a janitor in barracks number one. He soon acquired an additional duty as a snare drummer to beat out the first call to Reveille. He attached the large snare drum to a leather belt about his waist. Ten minutes before Reveille, each morning, he would parade the area in front of the barracks, beating out tunes on his drum. All right. Here we have a stereopticon image of the Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College mess hall from the 1890s. Um, and there's a note here, the woman in the doorway on the left appears to be an African American. So I'm going to bring up the full-sized image and we'll see if we can tell anything. In the doorway on the left, so this that's going to be here. Um, this doorway here on the left, that side of it has a little smudge. I will pull it over so you can see this side of the stereopticon image. So this is included because they're noting that this person here appears to be African American. Um, and this is, again, um, late 1800s, and this is the mess hall at on campus. Let's 
So next we have 1895, Samson Campbell. Samson Campbell drove a cart with a mule. Um, I imagine that caption would be longer if we knew more. Uh, so we have an image here from 1899, Samson and his mule. So we're still in like the early, early history here. Um, history like this is fascinating to me. My mom and I were going through a letter written by a relative that gave some history of the family, specifically an item of clothing we currently still have that was made in 1892. That is very, um, like that's amazing to me. I don't think my family has anything that old that has been retained. Um, so just having a piece of family history from that long ago is very interesting. Next, one of the better known figures in um, uh, black history at Virginia Tech is Floyd Meade. <clears throat> this is 1896 is the date given in the timeline here. Um, Floyd Meade was born in Blacksburg on October 2nd, 1882, and lived with the Thomas family. Cadet N.W. Thomas of that family acquainted Floyd with the barracks when he was only seven years old. He became a favorite of the cadets and the unofficial mascot of the Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College athletic teams. The cadets gave him the nickname of Hard Time. He used to run about Blacksburg ringing a bell to call attention to a poster advertising athletic contests to the college. Later, as the mascot of the football team, he traveled with the gridmen on their trips, frequently dressed as a clown in orange and maroon colors. When he was 14, he worked part-time at the mess hall. As he got older, he trained a huge turkey to go on a leash of orange and maroon ribbons. When he tapped the turkey with a whip, it would gobble. He would parade the turkey up and down the sidelines at football games and tap the turkey for a touchdown or spectacular play. The press made a big thing of it, and the football team became known as the Gobblers. Floyd Meade died in 1942. So we do have an image here of Floyd and his turkey. Um, and if you're familiar with the Virginia Tech athletics of today, um, you'll know that a turkey is still our mascot, although it is today referred to as a hokey bird, and uh, Virginia Tech is the Hokies. Um, oh, sadly, you're missing the first three letters, or three pages of the letter. Um, yeah, a good proper archive box to actually care for the items um, would definitely be useful, Hannah. Uh, and definitely, like, um, dealing with cloth is going to be different than dealing with paper. It should be possible to put them in the same box, um, but you're going to want to look at um, information specifically about how to preserve cloth. Um, you also, depending on age and other considerations, it's and, and really how much time and effort you want to put into it, you might want to look, um, see if a conservator will look at it and uh, give you some recommendations for preserving it. Um, generally, acid-free folders work good for paper. Um, cloth, you may need to have some mothballs or something in with it. Um, so researching on uh, like what to do specifically for the type of cloth. Uh, if the paper's really acidic, there might be some remediation that you would want to do with it. Um, and there are definitely some good resources out where you are. Um, I know that you're kind of uh, somewhere in Iowa there, and there are definitely um, good resources, potentially people you could consult at the University of Iowa who um, could give some advice on that. Um, they have a really good um, archiving, um, as well as like specifically book restoration, but they would be able to talk to you about uh, pr preservation for paper and, and cloth and things like that there. Um, so here we've got Floyd Meade and his turkey and um, 
this was basically the first mascot for Virginia Tech. Acid-free and lignin-free tissue paper for clothes. For, yeah, yeah, that all makes sense. We also have Floyd Mead with another unidentified man playing guitar. Iowa State has a textiles collection specifically. Um, I think Iowa State would be closer to you, Hannah, than, than the University of Iowa would. Um, and I know the, um, the director of special collections at, at Iowa State is an amazing person, and I'm sure that their staff there would, would happily uh, talk with you about how to preserve things. Or, or at least how to care for them, um, even if you're not ready to, to like donate them to an archives. But um, generally, uh, just a conversation with somebody asking questions about like, can you give me some advice on how to, um, how to go about making sure that I still have these things in 10, 20, 50 years. Um, that's something that most archivists could do. Oh, you and I, yeah, I, I was actually talking um, University of Iowa in Iowa City as, but yeah, it would be the other side of the state from you as well. Um, yeah, I don't know a whole lot about Nebraska resources, but Hannah, if you need help, you can always reach out to me um, through Special Collections here at Virginia Tech, and I will find someone to put you in touch with if you need help uh, locating Nebraska resources. <clears throat> um, so here in 1899, we have college characters, individuals who worked for VPI in 1899, um, Sporty Sam, Uncle Wash, Granville Evers, oh, I should read the full caption here. Uh, Sporty Sam, who is Charles Owens, Uncle Wash, who is Washington Eaves, Granville Eaves, uh, Hard Times, Floyd Mead, Samson and His Mule, Samson Campbell, Alonzo Freeman Sr., Smokey Sam, and Charles, Me and Canode, and Bill Bland. Uh, so I will pull that up and we can see. This is again from, uh, this is from the 1899 Bugle, which is the yearbook. Um, and zooming in made this really, really big. Uh, but here we've got Sporty Sam. So again, with the, uh, the drum, this is the same um, Uncle Sporty that uh, Charles Owens, that was his name. Thank you. <laughs> Thank me. Uh, <laughs> I'm saying thank you to me for pulling that up. Then we have Uncle Wash. So again, if you'll remember a couple of months ago um, when Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben's decided to finally change the names of their products, it was for reasons like this. Um, older black men were often referred to as uncle and older black women were often referred to as aunt and it wasn't a flattering thing. It was... Um, but, but that was how they were referred to, and you can see it here, like, he's referred to as Uncle Wash in the yearbook. Um, and his actual name is Washington Eaves. Uh, here we have Granville. So this is just like the yearbook. And these were people that were prominent enough on campus and in the experience of the students that they were included in the yearbook. These would have been well-known enough figures that people wanting to remember their time at Virginia Tech, uh, which was Vir Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College back then, um, seeing these images would have brought them memories of their time at the institution. But again, this was well before these 
people could ever have attended the institution themselves. Um, at the time, this was a fully uh, military um, agricultural college. Me and Canode. Um, and today we still have a Corps of Cadets, uh, so that is a, a tradition of the institution here. Um, but at the time, everyone who attended had to be a part of the Corps of Cadets. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I see there is a raid coming in on Rogan27 channel. Um, from 16-Bit Eric, Eric, thank you so much for bringing people over for this. Um, I'm in the middle of archival adventures. Um, today we are exploring um, the black history at Virginia Tech timelines. Um, so this is a show that I do every Wednesday from 2.30 to 4.30 Eastern time, uh, where I share materials from the archives at Virginia Tech. Um, and so today we're doing the black history timelines and um, you'll see uh, there is a thing above my head um, about Giving Day. It is Giving Day at Virginia Tech. If you want to pop over to the VTUL Studios channel, um, you can get more information on that there. Uh, but yes, thank you everybody. Um, Wraith Fay, Meaning of Night, Critter Nation, um, Adventures of Tony. Um, also, thank you for the um, resubscription Adventures of Tony. JC Thornclad, Jody Hauser. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for stopping by. And um, I'm going to continue with the exploration of some history here. Right now, we are in the pre 1950s period, um, about 1899 currently. Hi, New Stargazer. Um, uh, we have John Sears, uh, a.k.a. John the Barber. So this is 1917 on campus, and John the Barber came to Blacksburg around 1917. He was a favorite barber in Portsmouth, and the cadets talked him into coming to Blacksburg. His shop was on the quad in the barracks at first. Um, he had a phenomenal memory and remembered everyone and the positions they played. Alums used to look up Professor Rash... Rash? I do not know how to say that name. Um, and John the Barber, when they came back to town, he was a sports authority. And so we have an image here of John Sears from 1919, who was the barracks barber here on campus. Um, let's see, we are about a half an hour in. I don't want to spend all of our time in pre-1950s. So I am going to advance a little bit in time here. And we're going to move on to 1950s <laughs> so that we can move forward a little bit. Um, like I said, these are built on TimelineJS, which is an open source uh, tool using Google Sheets. Um, they have been loading a little bit slower than normal um, ever since Google made a couple of permissions changes to Sheets. Um, if it does break, I do have an option uh, to move forward. But for now, it is just a little bit slow. Uh, <laughs> also, if you are watching on the Rogan27 channel and you are not currently following the VTUL Studios channel, um, which is the main site for this show, uh, it would be lovely if you are interested at all to pop over and give us a follow. Um, VTUL Studios, we do a variety of programming from the Virginia Tech University Libraries. Um, that programming includes this show, Archival Adventures, as well as um, Bi-weekly on Fridays, we have um, a tabletop role-playing game live play show where we do one-shots based on literature. Um, I believe the next one is coming up this Friday and is based on uh, Detective um, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's based on Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it'll be run by our own mod, um, uh, Archivist Kira. Uh, so that is coming up soon. Um, ooh, Scary Poppins, thank you for the follow. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Um, so yes, Friday um, at 6 p.m. Eastern time, one shot um, for Sherlock Holmes. I'm not sure which system we're using for it, but that is coming. Um, also, uh, immediately, well, later today, there'll be a, 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 a program. There's a program happening after this stream. I have words. Um, at 5.30 Eastern today, it'll be the joy of 3D painting with Jonathan. Um, and 3D painting is not mini painting. It is 3D painting. And who knows what that looks like? I'm probably going to tune in and see if I can learn what 3D painting is. Uh, <laughs> but again, that is on VTUL Studios channel. Um, we also have more stuff that will be coming. I know there's going to be some 3D printing content in the future. Earlier today, um, Alice was on doing some um, music composition in a program that I've never heard of, and it was amazing. Um, so we are growing the channel. Um, hi, Orangitis. Welcome. Um, I'm going to continue looking at the timeline now that I have digressed and the timeline has had time to load. Uh, so now we're looking at the 1950s, and we will look at August 1953 when the first black student was admitted to Virginia, Virginia Polytechnic Institute. That student was Irving Linwood Pedro III, um, and you can see him here uh, in his cadet uniform from 1953. Um, there's also a newspaper article here. I will note, again, these are historical documents. Um, this show is focused on archives and we have documents from the past. Um, also, if you've not seen this show before, uh, today we are focused entirely on digital content. Um, we're looking at the online timelines. Usually I have boxes of physical materials and I'm showing them off on camera. Um, today we, I went with the digital timeline because um, pulling all of these materials together would be a lot of time to pull out and it's nicely condensed and presented in this timeline. Um, but there's a newspaper article here from the New from the Roanoke Times from September 1st, September. Wow. I'm going to take a sip of water so I stop saying the wrong words. Uh, <clears throat> Newspaper article from the Roanoke Times, September 11th, 1953, Virginia Tech admits first Negro student, student from Hampton. Um, so again, language included in these is not always going to be the language that we would use today, <coughs> uh, since they are historical documents. Um, the article itself here, uh, I'll see if I can read it for you. It's not transcribed, and the image, I can go full size, but it doesn't really get much bigger here. Um, so I will attempt to read it out for you. Blacksburg, September 10th. Virginia Tech has accepted its first Negro applicant for admission. It was announced today by Dr. Walter S. Newman, president. The applicant is Irving Linwood Pedro III of Hampton, who was accepted as a military day student. He will live off the campus and will be a member of the Corps of Cadets. Pedro intends to enroll in electrical engineering and is applying for Reserve Officer Training Corps in instruction toward a commission as second lieutenant. He is the first Negro ever to be admitted to Virginia Tech since its founding in 1872 as Virginia's land-grant college. Dr. Newman announced acceptance of Pedro after a poll of members of the Board of Visitors. The statement of policy approved by the majority of the board included the following. The board is advised and informed that the educational facilities and offerings sought by the applicant and offered by the institution are not to be had or found in comparable form and substance at any state-supported institution of higher learning maintained and operated by the state of Virginia exclusively for members of the Negro race. Whereupon the board having been appraised by the Attorney General of Virginia of the nature of the decision and precedents laid down by the Supreme Court of the United States, which have taken precedent over Virginia laws, 
is of the opinion that the applicant is legally entitled to admission under the particular and specific facts and circumstance which in this instance has found to exist. So not exactly an enthusiastic admission. He had to go to the Board of Visitors, which is the governing body of the entire university, um, <clears throat> and have them say that he could be admitted. He was not allowed to live on campus. And the only reason, based on their quote there, the only reason they admitted him is that the Supreme Court of the United States said that they had to. And so he is, however, the first uh, black student to attend Virginia Tech. Um, he had to find lodging in town, and there was a lovely family that housed him. Um, Kira, if you remember the name, can you please let me know? Um, we recently renamed one of our residence halls after that family, and their name is escaping my brain at the moment. Um, we also have a, a residence hall that is in part named after Irving Pedro. <coughs> Let's see, um, beginnings of the Council on Human Relations. We have a note here on the Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, um, May 17th, 1954. Um, the Supreme Court in that case unanimously decided that separate but equal educational facilities for racial minorities is inherently unequal, violating the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And so here on the timeline, we've linked out to the Wikipedia article, <clears throat> which I have mentioned multiple times before. Wikipedia is not a bad place to go and get a primer on a subject. If you just need it for personal use and you're just looking for general information about a topic, Wikipedia is not a bad starting point. Uh, if you're looking for something a little bit more in depth, Wikipedia can give you the basics of a topic so you can get your mind around it. And then you can follow the, follow the citation links on Wikipedia to more authoritative sources and begin your research from there. So uh, a lot of people think, oh, this is a librarian, this is a library, they're not going to want us to use Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a great tool, it's not an authoritative source. So I, I will step down off that soapbox now and continue, but uh, just wanted to throw that out there for you, that's why that's here. Um, so here we have a, a, an actual scan of the Brown versus Board of Education uh, ruling um, that is coming from the National Archives via Wikimedia Commons for the timeline. But essentially this is the ruling that um, forced the Board of Visitors to allow Irving Pedro admission to the school. In 1954, September of 1954, uh, we have more black students that matriculate to Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Uh, Charlie Yates, Floyd Wilson, and Lindsay Cherry matriculated. Um, and so the hall that is partially named after Irving Pedro is Pedro Yates Hall. So the other half of that is Charles Yates here, uh, who was a VPI cadet in 1958. And then we have um, Lindsay Cherry in his cadet uniform there. Um, and this image was actually published in 2019 in Walk by Faith, Not by Sight, The Life of Lindsay Cherry. Um, let's see, we've got some other images here. Floyd Wilson, Irving Pedro, and Charlie Yates, circa 1954, looking spiffy in their uniforms there. Um, So yeah, still 1954, all students admitted had to be in the Corps of Cadets. Um, so not only <coughs> were these students um, integrating the university, they were integrating a military organization that essentially directly fed into the United States military. The Corps of Cadets was intended as preparation for people to serve in the military. Um, and so by being admitted and being in the Corps of Cadets, they were helping to further integrate the military. 
<clears throat> so, whoops, I want this one. We'll close the other one. And then September 1955, we have Matthew Winston, uh, who was the class of 1959. Um, the fifth black male student admitted to Virginia Tech. After graduating, he had a distinguished career as a researcher for NASA, serving over 35 years, and was awarded an agency medal for his contributions to equal opportunity employment within NASA. So we actually have a number of connections at Virginia Tech with NASA, but um, this might be the oldest one that I'm aware of, 1955. I keep saying, if Kira's in chat, maybe she'll correct me. Um, I don't know if she's around at the moment, and I say that because she's been here a lot longer than me and might just know things off the top of her head that I would have to go and dig for. <clears throat> um, so a letter from Pedro. Irving Linwood Pedro's letter to the, to the Virginia Tech about his decision not to attend Ring Dance, 1956, April 13th, 1956. So Ring Dance, um, Ring Dance is a tradition here at Virginia Tech. It's a formal dance um, that happens around the time that like the class rings are released. And so the, the design of the class ring is announced and there's a formal dance and it's a whole thing. Um, I can't really make the image bigger. This is as large as it is, but I will read out the letter to you. Irving Pedro's decision. Dear sir, from what I understand, many of my classmates have been strongly concerned about my attending ring dance. It is true my girl and I had up to now hoped very much to come. What junior hasn't? But rather than be the cause of my embarrassment to my date or my classmates, I would like to make public my decision not to attend. I hope very much that in the near future, letters like this will not have to be written. I want to thank men, my many friends for their helpful encouragement. Cordially, Irving Pedro. Editor's note. Irving Pedro is the first Negro student to be admitted to VPI and now the first Negro to be eligible to attend ring dances. His decision not to attend the dance will no doubt solve, for this year at least, many problems, <clears throat> but will also leave the basic issues unsettled. We are forced to speculate what might have been the outcome if, if Irving Pedro had chosen the opposite course. White students and administration at VPI may now merely breathe a sigh of relief after being spared a difficult situation, or they may face the race question squarely in the realization that it will be with us from now on. What about next year's ring dance? So that's an interesting editor's note there. Um, the, the newspaper editor observing, correctly so, that just because Irving Pedro decided not to attend ring dance in 1956, didn't mean that ring dance would not at some point need to be an integrated function. Um, I think that's interesting. It doesn't tell me what newspaper this was in, um, we may not know. Um, yeah, not sure. September 1956, we have Essex Finney, a VPI cadet from Powhatan, Virginia. Um, after completing his degree in agricultural engineering in 1959, he earned his master's from Penn State and his doctorate from Michigan State. Dr. Finney was a Princeton Fellow in Public Affairs in the Woodrow Wilson School, Princeton University in 1973 and 74. He served from July 1980 to June 1981 in the Office of the Science Advisor to the President in Washington, D.C. for both Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. Uh, in 1985, the College of Engineering of Pennsylvania State presented Dr. Finney with an Outstanding Engineering Alumnus Award. Um, Worked for many years in the Agricultural Research Service of the United States Department of Agriculture. And in 1993 was appointed acting administrator of that body. We do have an oral history interview with Dr. Finney. I don't know if it will play. Um, I will attempt to play a clip of that. 
let's go to Experience Living in Blacksburg. So this is um, in our online collections. Uh, we have oral histories. We have both audio and video oral histories, although I believe everything in the Black History timeline is audio oral history. Um, and using a tool called the Oral History Metadata Synchronizer, or OMS, um, that is through University of Kentucky, I believe, um, we're able to add specific metadata and identify significant portions of the interview. So here, in the beginning, they talk about his introduction, uh, there's a short introduction and they talk about his childhood. And then at 14 minutes in, they talk about his social life. Um, and so here at 58 minutes, he talks about his experience living in Blacksburg. Um, it should play, though you may need to turn up the volume on the computer and simultaneously turn down the Pretzel Rocks volume. Okay, thank you, Alice. Let me attempt to do some of those things. Um, one second, one second. I will pull this back to my face while I make these adjustments. Um, <clears throat> so, let me go ahead and pause the music. may need to turn up the volume, you say. So the player volume is all the way up. We'll see. <clears throat> we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Definitely let me know once I hit play if you're able to hear it. I'm going to switch this back to the screen share. And I'm going to click on that section of the interview, and we will say play segment. Um, I wondered about how life was for you. I can't hear it, as a but I don't expect um, to be able to. You know, um, Let me know if you can. Could you, was there, could you go to a restaurant for a cup of coffee in Blacksburg? In Blacksburg? Uh, for a meal? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I know one thing, we couldn't go to the movie theater except living upstairs, going up to the uh, balcony. In fact, I think one uh, evening we decided to go down from the balcony and we were escorted out of the theater. So you went down, is that downstairs? And yes. Asked you to leave? Ask us to leave. If we weren't, if we weren't oh, willing wow. to stay in the balcony, then we would have to leave. I don't know if this is making any difference. I think Charlie Yates and probably Matthew Winston and I decided to sit somewhere else other than the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that didn't work out. Is, that didn't work out. Now, in terms of eating in the restaurants, I don't, I really don't remember, and it's probably because we didn't yeah. challenge it. So, um, and I'm not sure about Squires Hall, the student center across the road, whether or not uh, we could get something to eat there or not. I don't remember that. I don't remember. I know we couldn't eat in the cafeteria. Was that very upsetting to you when they asked you to leave the, you know, the lyrics? No, we expected it. So you just thought you'd check Yeah, we just thought we'd have a little fun, test it, <laughs> see what happened. <laughs> you know, after a while, you, you know what the traditions and what's expected, and uh, I guess if you test it and you're successful, you're more surprised than if you test it and it doesn't work right. <laughs> because you expect that it's not probably going to be accepted. Well, were things like you expected them when you came to check, or were things... No, they were as, as I would expect. I was, that's correct. Yeah, you ask about uh, the campus activities. You know, uh, one of the other things is that uh, we couldn't get a haircut in the barber shop. Oh. You know, there's a barber shop over there in the student building, Squires Hall. And, of course, the white students go over and get the haircut. But we couldn't go over and get a haircut in the barber shop. Now, of course, the, uh, after the barber shop closed, we knew the barbers. So after it closed, uh, we could discreetly go into the barber shop and get a haircut. But uh, no one would see us go in and get a haircut after hours. So, you know, that was sort of a little sideline artifact that... Uh, was the barber black? Yes, the barbers who worked there were black. In fact, the head barber lived in the same house with us at Mrs. Hoag's house. Oh. I don't remember his name, but uh, he was the head barber. 
and he lived in Bristol. I'm not sure if he lived on the Virginia side or the Tennessee side. So he would drive up. Uh, he would be here Monday morning. He'd run the barber shop during the week and stay at Mrs. Hogue's house during the uh, in the evenings. And then in the weekend, he'd go back to Bristol. So yeah, I don't remember his name, but yes, all of the barbers were black. But uh, the policy was that the black students, no black person could go in the barber shop and get a haircut. So that was the policy. And of course, mm. there's a big emphasis in the Corps on having your hair. That's correct. That's correct. Catch yeah, but we have to get our hair cut somewhere other than in the student union barber shop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Anything yeah. else like that that comes to mind? You know, things that were we had to sort of get around. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting looking back in retrospect. There was also a barber shop. Is this college? The entrance is that College Avenue. Mm-hmm. There was, a barber sh- there was a barber shop owned by a black barber, Mr. Sears, on College Avenue. John Sears. Have you heard his name? Well, Mr. Sears had a barber shop, too, and he was black, of course, and all his barbers were black. But we couldn't get our hair cut at Mr. Sears' barber shop either. Well, the reason is because the uh, traditions at that time, had we gone into his shop to get our hair cut, he probably would have lost all of his other customers. So we didn't, we didn't challenge Mr. Sears. We knew what what the situation was. He was a very nice fellow. In fact, we would go over to his house in the evenings and weekends and shoot pool for a little social activity. It was a very nice family. It just was the, uh, the tradition at that time, and that's, that's the reality of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think that's where we'll stop it. That should have got you through the uh, barbershop section about Mr. Sears. So... Um, yeah, so this is, this is segregation in the 1950s. Um, Mr. Sears worked as the barber for the white students, so he could not give haircuts to the one black student. Or, no, sorry, this is Finney. He couldn't give haircuts to the black students because he worked as the barber for the white students. Um, So yeah, this is totally, it it doesn't make sense, but that was reality. Um, So hopefully in the future I, I can give myself some headphones so that I can hear what's going on. That did, I think that worked. I was paying attention to just the time stamps on it to know kind of when the topic ended and it would be a good time to hit pause. Um, I'm going to do a little switchy thing here real quick. Back to my face uh, while I adjust. Hopefully I don't blow anyone's ears up. Let me know. Um, I'll put this back here. Let me know if the music is at a good volume again. Um, (laughs) And we will go back to the screen share and move along. Um, We are an hour in. (laughs) We've made it through a significant portion of time. We started in like 1777 and now we're in 1956. I think we're doing okay. So then we have Charles Yates, June of 1958, who was the first black graduate at Virginia Tech. Uh, He received a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, and Dr. Yates um, served on the faculty of Virginia Tech for four years in the Department of Mechanical Engineering from 1979 to 1983. And when he left, he left to head the engineering program at Hampton University. Uh, It says here he was also a visiting associate professor at Old Dominion University, um, which is also here in Virginia. And he also served on the Virginia Tech Board of Visitors, which, as I noted, was the governing body that had to weigh in on the admission of the very first black student here at Tech, Irving Pedro. 
And then uh, Yates returned to Virginia Tech in July of 87 as an associate professor in the Department of Aerospace and Ocean Engineering. So we have another newspaper article linked here, as well as a more modern image of, uh, for the oral history timeline for him. Um, the newspaper article basically saying, uh, the headline, that he would do it all over again. Um, I will go ahead and read this article for you, and then we'll move along. Um, VPI's first Negro graduate would do it all over again. Charlie Yates of Norfolk, one of six honor graduates in mechanical engineering. This is from NVP. I'm uncertain what newspaper. Oh, here it is. Norfolk Virginian Pilot is the name of the paper. June 10th, 1958. Uh, Norfolk's Charlie Yates completed a four-year pioneering educational adventure Sunday as he was handed his e engineering degree at Virginia Polytechnic Institute at Blacksburg. Yates, the first Negro to be graduated from the Virgi Virginia Military and Engineering Institute, finished with honors in addition. He, in addition, he is the first Negro to be graduated from any major Southern engineering institute. In 1954, Yates, an honor graduate of Booker T. Washington High School, entered VPI on his own and without benefit of scholarship. His final report card at VPI showed five A's and one B. Can you imagine going to school, going to college and having your report card reported in the newspaper. That is the, that is the type of scrutiny that these students were under. That is the type of like extra stress, the extra weight that these students had to go through just to pursue an education. Um, that is just amazing to me that, that they were like, that's a lot, a lot of extra stuff to put on a college age person. Um, quote, I've been very much impressed, pleased and surprised at the way things worked out there, he said after the graduation exercises. I've gotten along well with everyone, both students and faculty. And without hesitation, he said, I would do it all over again. I've gone alone and played by ear, and I would suggest that other Negro students in a similar situation would do the same. Again, just going to throw out there, it's been a little bit since we said it, um, these are archival documents. They contain language that is not appropriate for use today, uh, but I am reading them out as they are written. Some advice. My advice, he continued, would be to work hard, do his best, be careful with his actions, and take it slow. With time, acceptance will come. Try to become a friend of the students, and you'll have easy sailing. In 1958, VPI graduate, oh, the 1958 VPI graduate said that he was never mistreated by anyone during his four years at VPI. However, there were some things that perplexed me and I couldn't fully understand, but I didn't allow them to bother me. Dr. Walter S. Newman, president of the college, speaking at the exercises, said the 1958 class of which Yates was a member was the smartest class to ever graduate from VPI. Um, in three honor fraternities, Yates was one of the six honor students of mechanical engineering in the class and one of the two honor students from Norfolk. He was a member of three honor fraternities, Pi Kappa Phi, National Honor Fraternity, uh, Secretary of Pi Tau Sigma, National, Me National Mechanical Engineering Fraternity, and Recording Secretary, Recording Secretary of Tau Beta Pi. Yates will work during the summer with the Engine Division of Fairchild, Engineering and Airplane Corporation, New York. He has been granted a tuition scholarship and teaching apprenticeship at California Institute of Technology. 
he will begin work on his master's degree there in September. Following the trend of many sorry, following the trend of many of the graduates, Yates was married immediately after graduation uh, uh, to Miss Ernestine McDaniel of Blackstone. Yates is the son of Mrs. Annie Yates, who lives, and then they give the, they give the address of his mother in the newspaper. That just seems really inappropriate. Wow. I mean, 1958, I guess the world was different, but oh my gosh, that puts her in so much danger. <laughs> uh, next, we have Essex, Essex Finney graduating. One, one second, I have a thing I need to respond to here. Um, nope. There it is. Uh, how is everybody doing today? Um, you'll note, I'll point to the graphic up above. It was a, uh, it's giving day today. Uh, there's information, if you're watching in the VTUL Studios channel, uh, Mubot drops in that information occasionally. Any support? provided um, and uh, noted to go to the university libraries helps support things like this Twitch stream. Um, Okay. Um, Essex Finney graduating. Uh, so June 1959, um, Essex Finney graduated and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. Um, and you'll note here it says, during the 1950s, the black students lived and boarded at the Ho Hoag's home. Um, and the Hoag's, uh, William Hogue and Janie Hogue um, actually have now, within the last year, one of the buildings on campus was renamed after the Hogue family. Um, so we now have Hogue Hall, um, which is a residence here on campus. Um, Hannah, I see your note. I feel like that was pretty common at that time, regardless of what your skin color was. So the, the listing, the um, address in the paper? Is that what you were responding to? It's still, I just, even if it was com common practice, like putting a black family's address in the paper when you're talking about the furtherance of essentially integration just seems like putting somebody at risk. <laughs> like that to me is really surprising. Um, so we've got Yates, this was Yates, right? Essex, no, Essex Finney. Brain! Uh, Essex Finney here and, and the Hoags in the background. So they were just a, a family that lived in town. And because the black students weren't allowed to live on campus, they, they put them up as boarders. They let them come and live in their house um, so that they could attend Virginia Tech. Um, I do believe Mr. Hogue, I think one of them, I don't remember which one, and I don't believe both of them, but I believe one of them worked at Virginia Tech. Let's see, James Whitehurst and Robert Wells admitted in September of 1959. But let's move on to the 1960s now. So that is like the earliest, as far as like students, um, was the 1950s. Uh, 
there's definitely that pre-1950s history when there were um, slaves on the land here, helping to build buildings that later became part of the institution. Um, sorry, enslaved persons uh, on the, the, helping to build those buildings, um, as well as like the mascot and other like people who worked at the university in its early days. Um, but it was the 1950s when uh, black people were finally starting to be admitted to the school as students. So in the 1960s, um, we actually, as, as uh, foreshadowed here by the cover image for the 1960s timeline, we finally have black women admitted to the institution in the 1960s. <clears throat> so August of 1961 is when the high school here in Blacksburg was integrated. Uh, Philip Harmon Price and his sister Anna Christine Price integrated Blacksburg High School in 1961. And there is um, an interview on our site uh, linked here with a, an interview with Reverend Philip Price. Um, they were the children of Christine and Leonard Price. Let's see, Dr. Michael A. Cook interviewed Christine Price as part of the Black Appalachians Oral History Project. So we do have from uh, the 1990s, a collection of interviews of, um, with black people living in Appalachia about the experience of black people in the Appalachian region which is where Virginia Tech is located. Um, so that's where that would come from. We've got Robert Davis, a postal assistant, first black employee in the library. I feel like there's a little bit of bias here as to why this gets called out with a specific item, being that this was put together by people in the library. Um, but apparently Robert Davis in August of 1964 was the first black employee in Carol, Carol Newman Library. Um, <clears throat> extension, extension. First black women at Virginia Tech, September of 1966. So this is, I want to say just about a decade after the first black men, because that was, I believe it was 1954. And this is 1966, so about 12 years. Um, so uh, Linda Adams, Jacqueline Butler, Linda Edmonds, Laverne Hairston, Marguerite Harper, and Chiquita Hudson. Um, we have an entire oral history project focused on the admission of black women to Virginia Tech. Uh, here in this image, this was the cover image, we have uh, Laverne Hairston, Linda Adams and Chiquita Hudson, three of the first uh, black women to attend Virginia Tech. Um, so the black women at Virginia Tech Oral History Project, uh, we do have material online for it here. So we've got Cheryl Butler McDonald, Linda Edmonds, um, Linda Hoyle, Marguerite Harper Scott, uh, Fre Freddie Hairston. Um, we've also got an interview with Marva Davis, who Mar Marva Davis was the first black homecoming queen at Virginia Tech. Uh, Elaine Dow Carter and uh, Jackie Butler Blackwell. Um, most of these, the audio is going to be available for. I believe Linda Adams. Um, did not wish the audio released, so we just have the transcript there. I'm not sure of the details on that. I just know that we only have the transcript there. Um, but yeah, so these are going to be the same as, as like the interview that we listened to before. Let's see if there's one section that we might want to listen to here. Let's go here. It looks like if we listen to about three minutes, um, starting at about 10 and a half minutes in, we will have uh, something from uh, Freddie Hairston about 
pursuing mathematics and a uh, decision to come to Virginia Tech. So I'm going to go ahead and cue that up. And we will play this segment. Again, when I am playing these with the current setup, I am not able to hear them. Also, I need to, if I'm going to play another clip, I need to turn off the music so that you all can hear as best as possible. <laughs> Many moving parts to making this stream work. Um, but I do hope that you are finding it interesting and useful. Um, I'm going to bump up the volume. OK. Now, I will throw us back over there and queue up the transcript to the right spot. Oh, there we go. Kira in the chat. Uh, noted, um, much of the collection is also available in our Women's History at Virginia Tech project that also contains a transcript of the interview with Aldora Green, who worked at the university for more than 30 years, and audio is forthcoming on that interview. Um, it's actually a lot of work to do oral history and then transcribe it and get it all prepared. There's a lot of work that goes into getting it into this state so that people can listen to it and have a transcript to follow along with. Um, but we will play this segment here from Freddie Hairston's interview, uh, starting at about 10 minutes and 29 seconds and going to about 13 and a half minutes here. Um, on airs when I and came then back. I'm going to pop like this to the transcript. I don't remember doing that, but you know, it was like, because my voice would be different, and I'd be used to doing different things. But I, I can do that. I move in and out. I just came back from Japan. I, uh, I realized when I first came back from Japan, I was speaking English very weird. <laughs> but that was just because I was in another mode, and it was just another transition period. Were you going to Japan to a research? I was doing research to, to do research. Mm -hmm. And what topic? Labor market, the tightening labor market in the industrial and develop, mm -hmm. developed countries. Huh. We'll to go back to that okay. at the end. Okay. I'm sort of working up by yeah, time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, did you date much in high school? No. And did you have? Um, uh, male and female friends of both black and white? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, as a matter of fact, um, when I came to Tech, there were kids, I, some, some guys I had gone to school with at uh, Addison who were here, and there were also uh, about three people from my high school, from Fleming, that came here, including my, my math teacher. He came to graduate school. So we all came together. Huh. So I knew people when I came. So there was like a group of you that came. Yeah. Um, why did you decide to come to Virginia Tech? Oh, I think uh, my parents were kind of reluctant for me to head off halfway across the country, which was my inclination. <laughs> um, I really wanted to go to Mount Holyoke. Uh, I went to go to a girls' school, but it was too far away. My parents were just, and um, it was, it had a good math department, and I was I was a math major when I came. And because uh, at 10, I decided I wanted to be a mathematician. Uh -huh. and, uh, but um, that was mainly it. Were you encouraged in, in pursuing mathematics as a child oh, yeah. by your teachers? Uh, more so. Yes, in seven, beginning in seventh grade, I think, more so than by teachers. But um, at home, I, I, I grew up in a household where my brother and I, really were told anything we wanted to do, we could do it. All you have to do is work for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I used to watch Sputnik and, <laughs> you know, the early Mercury and Apollo stuff. And uh, I thought that was neat stuff. And we'd talk about it and stuff. And I was, you know, I was interested in doing maybe some background trajectory stuff like that. Okay. I think that should put us at the end of one topic and just before another one. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I didn't cut it off in mid-sentence mid or anything. 
Um, but again, I current setup, I'm going by timestamps to, to play those clips because I can't hear them myself. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit about, uh, from Freddie Hairston about um, her interest in mathematics as well as uh, coming to Virginia Tech, I believe. That's at least what it was described as. So hopefully that's what it was. Um, gonna... Come back here for one second while I readjust the audio settings. Please stand by. Uh, <laughs> this is the first time that I've done digital content on the program, so it's also the first time that I've had to deal with how to share things online and um, make all of the, the things work. So. Um, Thank you for bearing with me while we figure all of this out. Um, <laughs> yay, Kira, thank you. Um, all right. Uh, also in 1967, so a year after the um, black women were first admitted, we have the first black Virginia Tech Sports Hall of Famer. Um, so uh, Virginia Tech is known for some sports stuff. Uh, track and field, I would say, is probably not one of our better known areas. Um, our football team is pretty well known. Our women's basketball team is pretty well known. Um, but in 1971, Jerry Gaines uh, became a Sports Hall of Famer for men's track and field. Um, he was from Chesapeake, Virginia, and was the first full scholarship track freshman in Virginia Tech history. So not the first full scholarship black track freshman, the first full scholarship track freshman, period. Uh, the first person to receive a track and field scholarship, full, full scholarship uh, at Virginia Tech. Um, he was also the first black scholarship athlete and the first black person inducted into the Virginia Tech Sports Hall of Fame inducted in 1990. Um, graduated with a degree in foreign languages. Later taught Spanish and coached several sports for Chesapeake Public Schools and was named PTA Teacher of the Year in 1984 and 85. Lovely article about him being named Athlete of the Week from April 17th of 1986. Um, so all in all, from 1967 to 1968, 43 undergraduate black students and several black graduate students uh, attended Virginia Tech. In 1967, we have the first black member of the freshman basketball team. Larry Donnell Beal was uh, on the freshman basketball team, vice president and then president of Groove Phi Groove human relations chairman and member of the Black Student Committee. He earned his degree in so sociology and political science. And Groove Phi Groove, I'm trying to remember, like, it is a prominent organization. I'm going to bring up a Google uh, so that I don't misspeak about it. I probably am not supposed to... Um, do that on screen, but here we go. Groove Phi Groove is a social fellowship incorporated. Uh, so essentially it's a, a fraternity. Um, we'll look at some history here. Groove Phi Groove Social Fellowship Incorporated was founded at Morgan State College, now Morgan State University, on October 12, 1962 by 14 daring young black American men who wanted to change the way we think about brotherhood. Um, and so it, it's one of the major black fraternities on campus. Um, groove coming from the popular phrase from the 1960s. Uh, so yes, um, Larry Beal was president of Groove Phi Groove 
uh, when he was here at Virginia Tech. And we have an item on the timeline from April of 1968. The Phi Groove, Groove chapter of Virginia Tech was founded in April of 19, 1968. Um, and there's an image here on the timeline of the founding members of that organization from the 1969 uh, Virginia Tech Bugle. I guess it they may not be the founding members, it might be the second year. I'm uncertain because this is the 1969 Bugle and it was founded in 1968. Um, in April of 1968, historic events, um, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, there is in here a wonderful letter written in tribute from Linda Edmonds. Um, that is linked on the timeline. Linda Edmonds was one of the uh, first black women to attend Virginia Tech. I'm not going to read through that letter simply because we only have a half an hour left and I do want to um, get to some of the more recent items on the timeline. Um, 1968, the Human Relations Council uh, was created, or at least be, begins to appear in the um, Bugle. The Human Relations Council was essentially um, a group to bring together black and white students on campus and get them to work on things together. <laughs> um, there is some in information uh, in an interview by Ellison Smith, linked on the timeline about that. Um, in June of 1968, Linda Adams became the first black woman to graduate from Virginia Tech. Linda Paulette Adams, uh, now Hoyle, was the first black woman to graduate Virginia Tech with a b b Bachelor of Science in Statistics. Uh, we do have an oral history online from her, and she was also the one who authored the um, the response to Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. Um, Heidi Ford in 1968 was the first black person to work in extension at Virginia Tech. And if you're not familiar with extension service, um, essentially as a land-grant institution, extension provides uh, education and services for the community beyond Blacksburg, so uh, providing courses that members of the community could attend, um, not just services for Virginia Tech students. So it's kind of an outreach function of the university. Um, part of extension means that we have facilities in all counties in Virginia as being a land grant that mission and the extension service. Basically, we have a presence all across the state and we serve um, all across the state and provide services to, uh, to the community more broadly than just our students. Uh, from 1968 to 1969, we had approximately 75 to 80 black students. Um, and then September of 1968, Marguerite Harper served on the Standing Senate Committee for Credentials and Elections. So starting to get some actual like decision-making within uh, the university from people of color. Um, in 1969, September of 1969, we have our first black varsity basketball starter, Charlie Lipscomb. Uh, so showing up in sports, um, starting to integrate and diversify the sports teams on campus. And so October of 1968, we had our very first black homecoming princess. Uh, Jacqueline De Silvia Dandridge was the first black homecoming princess. She graduated in 1971 with a BS in biology. Um, And in the image here, she is all the way up here in the back on the left. Uh, 
it takes another 20 years to get the first black homecoming queen, I believe. I want to say it was like 86, but uh, we'll find out as we move through. Um, first black academic faculty member hired, Overton Johnson, in August of 1969. Uh, he was hired to teach in the College of Agriculture. Black Greeks at Virginia Tech honored Dr. Johnson with the Overton R. Johnson Step Dance Show every year, in which both fraternities and sororities participate. An essay contest in his name w was held every year as well with scholarship awards. The Overton Johnson Step Show um, continued for quite some time. Um, I know in recent years, basically since I started working here, it has not been something that has happened. Um, I'm not sure exactly when the step show stopped, but I do know that there were discussions of starting it again. Um, I had been talking with a, a couple of people February of last year about restarting the Overton Johnson step show, um, but then of course uh, the world changed in March of last year, so um, plans to uh, restart and reinvigorate the Overton Johnson Step Show were put on hold because most in-person activities were put on hold. And I am not currently aware of what the plans are with regard to reviving that, but it was a tradition for quite some time. Uh, let's see, John Dobbins, first black scholarship football player in Virginia Tech history. Um, but we are into the four o'clock hour and we on this program only go until 4.30, so I do want to look at the 70s and 80s at least. Um, we may not get to the 90s and 2000s, but I definitely want to <clears throat> take a look at some of the 70s stuff and 80s stuff. All of this um, is available online. I know I've seen either Alice or Kira dropping links in the chats um, to where you can actually follow along. You could bring up these things at home um, or feel free to explore this timeline on your own time. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning, most of the items on this timeline we have physical materials for. Um, so if you happen to be in the Blacksburg area and you want to come in and actually review some of these materials in person. Um, you are welcome to stop by. Uh, the library is open to the public. Special Collections and University Archives is open to the public. Um, we are currently appointment only, uh, so you would need to book an appointment in advance to come and use Special Collections materials, but um, the materials are free for use of the public. You do have to use them on site, um, but we're happy to uh, pull things out of the collection uh, like out of the back and bring them out so that you can see them in person. Um, so 1970s, Alexis Johnson was hired as postal assistant, assistant campus mail center. Um, I don't know anything more than that. Uh, we have the first black student earning, students earning advanced degrees in June of 1970 uh, with Camilla Anita Brooks from Matthews, Virginia, and Franklin McKee from Augusta, Georgia, earning Masters of Science in Statistics. So June of 1970, we award the first master's degrees to black students at Virginia Tech. Um, and then we have James Whitehurst, the first black person appointed to the Board of Visitors. Uh, I do believe that the, so I mentioned earlier that we had um, Hogue Hall, which was one of the, one of the buildings was renamed, we had two buildings renamed in the last year um, because they had previously been named for people with associations uh, with white supremacy or other um, issues of racism, things like that. And um, after many years, they were finally renamed. Uh, and one of them was renamed to Hogue Hall to honor the Hogue family who housed the original black students to attend. The other one, I believe, was named Whitehurst Hall after James Whitehurst, who was the first black person appointed to the Bo Board of Visitors. Um, 
So just noting that it wouldn't be on the timeline because it was in the 2020s and we don't have a 2020s timeline yet. Uh, in 1971, the Human Relations Council sponsored Black Week uh, with Dick Gregory. I'm curious, so let's open this one up and see what that's all about. So this is a Bugle page, a uh, page from the yearbook. Um, Human Relations Council left officers rap with Dick Gregory. Uh, left to right, Major Riddick. President, Myron Grimm, Myron, wait, Major, what? I'm going to stop talking for a second and calm down my tongue. Left to right, Major Riddick, President, Myron Rim, Miss Blackweek, Dick Gregory, Sylvia Swilly, Vice President, Francine Richardson, Treasurer. The highlights of Black Week which was sponsored by the council, were a speech by Dick Gregory, a tribute to Black War Dead by Black Cadets, and a tribute to Martin Luther King on his birthday, which was held in the War Memorial Chapel. War Memorial Chapel is one of the buildings on campus, and it is a non-denominational chapel, uh, kind of a more solemn space where things of a more solemn nature tend to be held. Um, some photos there from that. Alfonso Smith, first black PhD, June of 1971. He got a PhD in fisheries and wildlife. Um, unfortunately, it does not appear that we have a photograph of him. But June of 1971, we finally awarded a doctorate to a person or to a black person on this campus. <clears throat> In August of 1971, uh, Amos Boffman Jr. and James Ramsey were hired as campus police officers for the Virginia Tech Police. So here in the 70s, we're starting to expand our hiring. In, to include black people. We have Anna Dickerson, who was the first black library assistant hired by the library in 1971. And in October of 1971, the Heidi Tidies, um, who are the regimental marching band uh, for the Corps of Cadets, stopped playing Dixie as, uh, at football games. So the song was dropped at the request of football coach Charles Coffey, who said it was hurting recruitment. Um, and here we have an image from, oh, from the Heidi Tidy, which is the newsletter of the Heidi Tidies. Um, read expert excerpts on the Dixie controversy. So this is White text on black uh, from this newsletter. Perhaps the greatest scandal to rock the 100-year history of the Heidi Tidies was the trouble that cropped up surrounding the beloved spirit song, Dixie. During 1970 and 71, the black students at Virginia Tech became increasingly uneasy about the band's playing of Dixie at pep rallies and football games. They claimed that the song was a racial slur and demanded that we cease the playing of it. The Heidi Tidies, strong-willed lot that we are, and always have been, were not too keen on the idea of not playing the song that had been such an integral part of the Heidi Tidy history, and the issue soon came to a seething head. Numerous editorials poured into the CT, the Collegiate Times, the campus newspaper, who, by the way, officially sided with the blacks. Yeah, again, terminology we would not use today. Uh, both for and against the halting of Dixie, and we eventually lost the battle. Both campus officials and the Commandant of the Cadets, Major General F.T. Parchler, decided that the band had become far too independent and we were ordered to remove Dixie from our repertoire. The official reason for that action was supposedly in the form of a request from the then head football coach, Charlie Coffey, 
who said that he felt that Dixie hindered the recruitment of black athletes for his program. Larry Waters, Tech's first black admissions director, was also of that opinion. The Heidi Tidies regretfully complied. And then there's information. There's a copy of the marching arrangement of the song that was used by them. Some newspaper articles and other materials uh, detailing kind of the back and forth over whether that song would be retained or removed. So if you want to dig more into that, that is on the timeline there, um, along with articles from the Collegiate Times uh, referenced in that introductory portion from the Heidi Tidy. Some more new hires growing the, the staff. 1970s Hunter Bell, longtime cook and major domo at the University Club, retired. So we know when he retired, seems like we don't know when he was hired. Got the Human Relations Council from 1973. Rhonda, okay. So 1973, Rhonda Miller Rogers, first black secretary. She later joined the Cultural and Community Center's team as Executive Assistant, Intercultural Engagement Center. She received the VT Division of Student Affairs Heroin Award and was a recipient of the President's Award for Excellence. Rhonda worked as a secretary in the Cultural and Community Centers, in the Intercultural Engagement Center, in Student Affairs, um, supporting that important work from 1973 until I want to say she retired in 2019. I was here. I've met Rhonda. She was an amazing person. And it's just lovely to see her face on this timeline. Um, <laughs> James Edwards, instructor and extension leader in 4-H. January 29th, 1973, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, the Theta Iota chapter was founded at Virginia Tech by a group of ambitious black men known as the Fine Nine. Anthony Dennis Crisp, Daryl Anthony Givens, Clarence Linwood James Jr., Jerry Nathaniel Johnson, James Kirkpatrick III, Louis Anthony Marshall, Ronald Sinclair Robinson, Warren Carlton Rogers Jr., and James Earl Williams. The Theta Iota chapter has had the privilege of having 235 men cross into alphadom. These men have carried on the tradition set by past alphas by adhering to the fraternity motto, manly deeds, scholarship, and love for all mankind. Hampton Smith, Jr., hired as assistant professor of chemistry. Hi, it's a Smalls world. How are you? I'm... I'm doing a program today that is called Archival Adventures, where I show materials from the archives at Virginia Tech. Um, Cheryl Butler McDonald was second commander of the original L Squadron, the first group of women to enter the Corps of Cadets. So September of 1973, we have L Squadron. And here in the photo, in the very first women's squadron in the Corps of Cadets, um, we have our very first black woman in the Corps of Cadets as well. And so L Squadron, they, they segregated the Corps of Cadets. L Squadron was the only squadron for women in the Corps of Cadets. Um, but in 1973, Cheryl Butler, uh, later Cheryl McDonald, was the second commander. Um, Student Government Association Senator Tony Crisp, 1973. And then we get uh, our first black player on a Virginia Tech women's varsity basketball team, Diane Epps, September 1973. Um, oh yeah, Smalls, it's, it's a lovely, um, it's a lovely program. I enjoy doing it. Uh, this week we're doing 
um, the Black History Timeline. Uh, so everything that I'm showing off this week is online. Usually I have actual archival materials next to me and we pull out the folders and look at the physical materials. Um, but today it's all digital. So I actually get to have water with me today. <laughs> Um, let's see, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to skip through some of these hirings and sports items so that we can get to some of the stuff from the 1980s before the, before we end. But again, this is all online, so you're welcome to go and explore it on your own if you're at all interested in further exploration of the history of, uh, black people here at Virginia Tech. Um, Overton Johnson, July of 1975, became the first black dean. So he was the first black academic faculty and then later became the first black dean of a college, um, that being the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Um, let's see. So in 1979, Melanie Pearson, who, and uh, Stephanie Turner. So Melanie Pearson became the first homecoming queen candidate from the Black Student Association, and Stephanie Turner was the freshman attendant candidate from the Black Student Association. Um, Melanie Pearson did not become homecoming queen, but this is a candidate from the BSA. <laughs> yeah, usually I have my water in a sealed container on the floor and I have to like move to the side. Um, and just today, because I don't have any actual materials out, I can actually take a sip of water whenever I need to without like sliding to the side. Nineteen eighties. definite change in style in the photographs. If nothing else, it's fun looking at these just to see the change in, in style in each decade. Uh, May of 1980, we have Phi Beta Sigma. The Mu Nu chapter of Phi Beta Sigma was chartered um, by Chuck Bishop, Bruce Carver, Roger Freeman, Kurt Holloway, Kenny Johnson, Tony R. King, and Eric Pankey. June of 1980, we have the first black father and son graduates. The first black American father and son graduate students to receive degrees at Virginia Tech. Winston Marcus Whitehurst, um, MA 1972, PhD 1973, Curriculum and Instruction, and Ricardo Antonio Whitehurst, MA 1980, Student Personnel Services. So the first legacy uh, finally happens uh, for the black community at Virginia Tech in June of 1980. Um, Smalls, yes, I am the uh, community collections archivist in Special Collections and University Archives here at Virginia Tech. So. Um, let's see, we have June of 1980, Dr. Jean L. Harris, the first female to give a commencement address at the university. The 108th commencement, Dr. Jean L. Harris, appointed Secretary of Human Resources for Virginia by Virginia Governor-elect John N. Dalton, was the first female ever to address graduates at Virginia Tech. Um, so not just the first black woman, but the first woman to uh, give a commencement address at the institution. Cheerleaders uh, Techniques, which is a university, was a university dance group, September of 1980, they get their first uh, black participant. So all of these people you know, starting in the 1950s when Irving Pedro was admitted uh, thanks to um, 
thanks to the Supreme Court saying that integration had to happen. Um, and here in the 80s, we're still getting firsts. So 30 years later, we're still getting the first black person to be a part of X organization. Um, it's just a long legacy of continual fighting to uh, be included in all aspects of campus life. Um, September 1980, Wayne Robinson was named Most Valuable Player for the All-Metro Conference. Let's see, Most Valuable Player of the 78-79 season and Team Captain of the All-Metro Conference. Um, graduated with a degree in finance, was first choice of the LA Lakers in the NBA draft in 1980. and build up, built up an endowment to fund scholarships for recruiting minority students and students with financial need. Um, all right, we got five minutes. I'm gonna click through a few of these. I did want, because it came up earlier, I wanted to find Marva Felder, Marva Felder um, Homecoming 1980, we had Karen Morrison, who was a candidate from the BSA. Um, I stopped on that because looking for Marva Felder, if you'll remember, I mentioned earlier she was the first black homecoming queen, and so I did want to find that actual entry here. And like I said, I think it's like 1986. but possibly not. When was it, Kira, <laughs> if you're there? Um, we, of course, have Nikki Giovanni in August of 1987, first female full professor in the Department of English. She is still here today um, and is very well known. 1983, Hannah, I will head back there and see Uh, Marva Felder. Yes, you did see her name back there in 1983, um, but it is actually 1982, but you, Hannah, you helped me find it, so thank you very much. <laughs> October 1982, Marva Felder, first black homecoming queen. Uh, Felder was also a member of the Student Budget Board on the Commission of Student Affairs. Um, a 1983 graduate in biology, she received the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Tech in 1987. Um, and I don't know. So this is a nice photograph, but it is not the most iconic one of her. Do we not have the really iconic celebratory photo. Oh, I think it's here. Um, this photo of Marva Felder from the homecoming game and just the look on her face when they finally... <laughs> Smalls, thank you. Um, the look on her face when, like, the utter shock of being named homecoming queen. Um, the absolute joy and excitement. Um, I love this photograph. This is one of my favorite Virginia Tech history photographs of all time. Um, and this is a moment in time. This was entirely periphery to her educational journey. She became a, a got her doctorate in veterinary medicine. Um, she's published on many, many things. Like, this is just a small aspect of her as a person. But just breaking that barrier um, and becoming homecoming queen for Virginia Tech in 1983, more than 100 years after the founding of the school, to be the first black woman named homecoming queen was a huge deal. Um, and I just, I love the passionate joy on her face uh, with that. So. Um, sadly, that is where we are going to have to 
stop our exploration for today. Um, we have reached the end of our time for this show. Um, we do have uh, additional programming happening on the VTUL Studios channel in about an hour. Uh, and that will be at, starting at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We will have the joy of 3D painting with Jonathan here on the VTUL Studios channel. So um, do come back in an hour and join us for that. Um, I'm interested to see what that's like. I don't know what 3D painting will be, will entail. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see what that looks like. I am going to um, send you all somewhere in the meantime, though. But please do return. Um, for now, I think I'm going to send you all over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. You get some nice background noise, see some wonderful stuff about uh, sea creatures. Um, <laughs> Smalls, it was lovely to have you drop in. I hope I see you again. Uh, that goes for everyone. If you are um, here for the first time, uh, definitely drop a follow. Um, we, I do archival adventures every Wednesday. We have a tabletop role-playing live play show on Fridays um, at 6 p.m. Eastern, where we do one-shots based on literature. This Friday, uh, that will be Sherlock Holmes, uh, one-shot based on Sherlock Holmes, 6 p.m. twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. And so I would love for you to stop by and see that. Um, but for now, uh, have fun. I believe it's the jelly cam today. So some wonderful imagery of jellyfish from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and I hope that you all will come back in about an hour for Jonathan's introduction to 3D painting. Um, I will see you all next week. Uh, until then, have a good evening. <laughs>